Hi there guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome to the Geek Group. Today we're doing an equipment autopsy on a Regency Act R106. This is kind of cool because we get to talk about crystals and all kinds of neat stuff like that. This is, it's it's a police scanner, really. It's it's basically what it is. It's a, the simplest form of programmable scanner that I've ever known. I When I was like a little kid, I got one of these out of the junkyard and it may be this one. It's been around for a while. This is really neat because, all right, a radio is, that you, you don't care about that. A radio is a tuned circuit, right? It's a resonant tuned circuit, and that's pretty much the basis of radio. Well, down inside, sorry about that. Down inside here, as we look down right there, you see that little row there? Those are all crystals. These are little quartz crystals. And you're probably used to radios today where like when you want to change the channel, you you know press the clicker or you, you turn the knob or whatever and you watch the numbers on display change. And it changes the frequency of the radio and it receives on different frequency. You couldn't do that with this. If you wanted to change the frequency that this record that this would listen at, you had to unplug one of the crystals and they look like this. And here we'll we'll give you a little close-up shot. That's that's a crystal right there. And this one is, I'm holding it upside down. This one is 154.725 is what it says on the little can there. And it's just a little metal can with two pins out the bottom. Inside is a very precisely sized and shaped quartz crystal. And this crystal resonates at 154.725 megahertz, which is really cool. This is neat. Now, because of that, here's, here's everything you need to know about how to use this radio. On the front of it, you've got these controls. Okay, you've got a row of 10 switches, and these are just on and off switches. And then you've got scan or manual, step, which is a momentary push switch, and then on or off. Now, you now know everything you know need to know to be able to use this effectively. You've got volume on this end, you've got squelch on this end. So everything you need to know, you turn it on, you turn the volume up until it's, you know, you turn the squelch all the way down, you turn the volume up until it's where you want it to be, you turn the squelch up until it stops screaming at you, and then you pick what frequencies you want to listen to. If you, because when you hit scan, you put this over in scan mode, it'll just if you want to listen to frequencies one, two, and three, you turn the switch on for one, two, and three, turn all these off, put in scan, and it's going to go and it'll just step through each one of those. And when it gets a signal on one, it'll stop. The light will come on, and it'll you'll hear that sound. And when it stops, it'll go on to the next one. It's really simple. If you want to listen to one, two, three, and six, you turn on the switch for six. It'll go and it'll just skip over the ones that are off. If you want to do it manually and you want to listen to just six and monitor it because you like channel six because it has the yellow LED that's been replaced, use the step thing and you step manually. You set this over to manual and you step over one at a time and you're there. This is the simplest radio ever. I've never turned it on and I figured out how to use it instantly. Okay, this, this is elegant. This is an intuitive device. It's also really simple down inside. There's not a whole lot to it. And this is back when things were tunable and fixable because you can see all these. These are variable inductors and you put a plastic Allen wrench down inside there. Don't use a metal one because the metal wrench would have its own inductance and when you touch it to the ferrite core you'll screw it all up. But if you use a plastic Allen wrench, it's a special little tool for these, you can turn those and it changes the resonant frequency of that particular LC circuit. So. That's how it was done back in the day. And I wonder, I don't know if I can make this work, but we'll try. I've got right here, I have the plug for this. I don't even need the plug. Don't even need the plug because I've got a 120 volt power supply right next to me. So we can just do this the hard way. But for safety, I'll cinch these down a bit. All right, I'll put that, no, I'm, because I have all this stuff back here and I don't have, I'm an idiot, I totally have a plug right there. I'm still getting used to the new sets, it's a thing. Now there's no antenna hook to this. Oh, it just came to life. It just came to life. OK, 
Okay, now we'll turn all the channels on. This may not work at all for anything, but watch. I'll do exactly what I said I was gonna do. It's turned on. I've got the squelch all the way down. Bring the volume up and we, sh we should hear noise. Squelch is a noise gate because with any radio, you're gonna have a background noise, just static between channels. So you're gonna have something. And squelch lets you, it's, a noise gate works, and, and here's the link to a noise gate where you can get the details on it, but the, the simple version is a noise gate is a device where if your background noise goes up to about here, and what you're listening to is up here, like if you were listening to me, and you don't want to hear the fan across the room or something, you get a noise gate, and the noise gate lets you say, okay, all sounds below this level, and you can adjust the level, we're just going to ignore. Once sounds come across above this level, then we're going to open the gate and let all the sounds through. You'll hear the low stuff too, but since the other stuff is so much louder, you won't notice it. That's how a gate works. You'll see these used a lot in audio. But we bring the squelch up and you'll hear, well, we'll bring the volume up and you'll hear noise. Okay, now as I bring the, the squelch up, you'll hear the noise stop. Now that may be because my knob is dirty. Nope, that, that actually stopped it really well. So there, that's because we don't have an antenna in here, so it's not really getting any noise at all. Um, we might be able to fake an antenna. This is a great way to fake an antenna. Never do this on a transmitter. Never, ever, ever turn on a transmitter without an antenna hooked up to it, because if you keep a transmitter, you'll burn it out. But with a receiver, you can totally just take the little PL plug in the back, Stick a screwdriver in there. And for bench testing, it works. It's not going to be anywhere near the right frequency or anything like that, but if there's something loud and close, we might be able to get it. Now, we'll put this on scan. I'll have coverage general fire at the panel. There you go. Now, if you take screwdriver out, let's see if we still hear anything. Oh, we need somebody to talk. But, but it works. It's a scanner. It works. And that's really cool. It's, <laughs> I just got blind lucky. It must have been from somewhere local from years ago. Now, the frequency is dependent on this. And here's our little quartz crystal. That's how you set the frequency. If you want to change... 1625. No, it still works even if I take thing out. It's that, it's that strong. It gets better if I plug the screwdriver in, but it works without it. That's really cool. That is so neat. Which tells me that the transmitter is really, really close or at a compatible frequency range or something like that. All right. That's how they used to do it with the old school. It's a terrible sound. With the old school crystals. And you can see all the crystals are in a row right there. And if I reach in, and, and I'm doing this with it plugged in and the power on because safety. If I had, I need to move some stuff here. If I reach in there with a pair of pliers and I grab this crystal and pull up on it, you got to wiggle a little bit. There's my crystal. Now this crystal is 42.580. And you can see it right there's your crystal, 42.580. So that tells me that that channel, which I think is 10. Yeah, that's channel 10. Okay, now channel 10 was set to 42 megahertz, 42.58 megahertz. Now if I take this other crystal and I stick it in the two little pins, and you can see there's, there's two little pins right down in there. By plugging that crystal in there, now I have channel 10 on a totally different frequency. Okay, we're gonna turn that down. Now, it's a really simple, easy way to change channels. It works. It worked for decades. I'm gonna unplug that for safety. And that's an entirely analog circuit. Everything in there, pure analog. It's very simple. It's, it's classic, it's really cool. And it works, and I'm just gonna leave it together. I'm not gonna destroy that because there's nothing to autopsy. You're, you can see it's just one circuit board. There's a little power supply section back here. Oh, there is one chip. One simple chip. Um, 
It's a 501-271-1 chip, 7843, made by Regency, which is the company that made the radio. So it's probably some kind of timing chip or maybe part of the gate. But yeah, it's, it's very analog. It's very simple. From the looks of it, it's 70s, maybe 80s vintage at the latest. It's, it's easy. Now here's where they went. Ah, here it is. This is an ICOM. It's uh, a model RC5, IC RC5. This uses, it, it does the same job. It's a radio that you can program the frequencies into. It's a little handheld scanner. Uh, we use them with our wireless microphone systems. The first thing you'll notice is it's a lot tinier. Easy, fits in your pocket. Runs on a couple batteries. I wonder if I can get it apart easy enough. These things can be a bit of a bear to get apart, but I'm gonna give it a shot. This uses what's called a PLL, a phase lock loop. And that is how this little radio uses a computer instead of crystals in order to change its frequency. And it's kind of cool to see the difference between an analog radio and a digital radio because they're both the, the exact same thing. They both do the same job. But how they get there is very different. And this is cool to see just how far the technology came. Let me take a look in there. It's totally different. We've got our big speaker here. This is receive only, so there's no, there's no transmit function in here. We've still got the something that matches the other one. If you look here, there's another one of those variable inductors. You see the little metal box with the ferrite core, and there'll be a coil down in there. That's an antenna right there, built into it. So that's an antenna just for a different frequency band than, than this much longer antenna that sticks on the top. Problem with these is there's not gonna be a whole lot to see. I'll try and show you what I can, but it's gonna be pretty simple. It's just gonna be a matter of getting into it. All right, so we've got the cover off and that took a concerted effort. If you ever need to buy a brand of portable scanner, I strongly recommend ICOM. They make pretty tough stuff. So take a look inside here. You can see this is the inside of a modern digital radio. And we've got our little antenna we talked about earlier. I'm gonna slide this out because this is kind of cool. We've seen these before. This is one of those ferrite bars. It's made of a compressed iron powder. They're really brittle. You see these a lot in radios. That The same stuff this is made out of, that ferrite, is the exact same stuff this little variable inductor is made out of. That's a ferrite core. If we uh, took a screwdriver to that and took the top off, you'd see the same thing. So inside here, there isn't really a lot to see at the level that we like to explore because you're getting some pretty advanced electronics and stuff. You can see there's the antenna jack here, which is pretty much pooch. We don't need that. And then the rest, this is, this is all digital. This is modern day stuff. So we gotta, because it's designed to work with radio frequencies, everything's very, very shielded because this is a crazy high gain amplifier. It's very, very sensitive. So I'm gonna take a moment and peel off all the shielding so that we can get a look under it. And maybe we'll see some parts we can identify for you guys. We'll see what we can do. All right, so we've got our cover off and this is the inside of our little ICOM radio. Now, I'm gonna take this off. This is the liquid crystal display. And I'm going to set that aside because they're really cool to play with, and we'll check that out in a minute. And we can get rid of this, which is just the mount for the display. This is the backlight for it. So we don't need that. And there's just a little LED right there on the side, and that lights up the backlight. Now here is what appears to be the main processor chip because there's only one big giant chip in here with lots and lots of pins. So I'm guessing that's the brains of the operation. And that is basically the computer that runs this radio because it's, it's a computer. It's, it's a tiny little computer. Now let's go in a little bit deeper. We'll separate this off. Now we've got the small daughter board and the big main board. Now on the, on the one side of the big main board, we've just got the main 
processor chip and you can see down here the gold traces. See how the fingers interlock on the little gold traces? That's where you find buttons. This is a, a rather clever way to do buttons. They've done them like this for a long time now. But the buttons themselves, the part that you touch, look like this. And they're just injection molded silicone. On the back of the button is a little piece right there. You can see that. I'll let you guys get a really close up view of it. As you push the button out, that little black piece down there is conductive. And that piece bridges over the fingers on the board. So that closes the circuit. It's a really easy way to make a switch. They, they print the fingers on as part of the board etching process. And they injection mold the button. And the button's made in such a way where there's a little spring to it. It's just molded right in. It's all one piece. This is just one piece of rubber with some different parts tinted different colors and then the conductive pucks molded right into there. So this is all one piece. There's nothing here to break. And they last for a very long time and they're weatherproof and all kinds of stuff like this. So this can, depending on how it's shaped and how it's made, can be put into the radio where this stays waterproof for years and it's a really good thing to have in a radio. So let's flip this over and look at the other side. Now this is pretty much the, the heavily populated side of the board with all the little stuff on it. We've got jacks. This is a, a switch. It's a rotary switch. I thought it was a potentiometer at first, but no, nope, it's a rotary switch. And no, nope, that's a potentiometer. See, it's only got three spots there. So my guess is this is a potentiometer with a rotary detent that gives it notches for like volume and stuff like that. Um, We've got the power jack over here. This will be a headphone jack up here. We've got a little box totally encased. I can't open that up without soldering it, so I'm not gonna mess with that. And then the rest is all just discrete components. There's, there's capacitors and resistors and some various small chips. This looks like a power regulator chip, you know, things like that. So that's, but it's all just a little computer. The other board, more of the same. A lot of simple circuitry. Right here, look at that. That is another timing crystal. That is the exact same thing as this. It's a little metal box with a quartz crystal in it. I'm gonna take a look in there, get you the frequency. This one is CR.5957H, so, or 593.7H. So my guess would be this is 593 megahertz or something like that, but it looks to be a timing chip, a quartz crystal. There's a couple little inductors down here. These little white things just have a couple turns of hair thin wire around them. And then we're back to the wire antenna back here. Now this part's cool. This is a liquid crystal display. And there's a cool feature here that I wanted to point out. On this part here, you can see there's this row along the top of all these little gold contacts. Those little contacts touch this strip here, this white strip. It's like a reverse Oreo, it's black on the inside. And those carry charge through. This is the jumper strip. If I peel this strip off, it's got the insulating white layer, the conductive black layer, and the insulating white layer. Now, what I don't know is how they make the black layer because I'm guessing the black layer has to be slices, lots and lots of little slices in order to carry the jumpers through because if it was all just one big conductor, then it wouldn't work. Now, this doesn't look like much right now, but and it's not gonna show up on camera really well at all, but because of the way these work, if you squeeze them and manipulate them, you gotta be careful because it's glass and it's really easy to break. But if you, if you flex it a little bit and if you squeeze it and move it around, sometimes you can figure out what the display was because the parts on there that display the segments and the letters and the numbers are permanently etched into the, the substructure. So if you touch, and, and you'll see this as you experiment, it's not gonna show up on camera very well, but if you touch the end, the contact end, and if you fiddle with it, and if you move around and get some static electricity and stuff like that, there's, it, it has to do with the phase of the moon and the curvature of the earth and your specific gravity and all that. It's, it's insane, nobody really knows how it all works. But <laughs> you can make random things appear on the display and you can kind of get a feel for what's on the display. You can, if you're really deeply motivated, Put it all together, mount it, 
put this in there, get it all to work just right, and by exciting different areas of here electrically in the right way, because you're gonna find that it's gonna have a common cathode or a common anode or something like that, that you'll be able to get things to appear on the display. There's serious electronics involved in doing that. It's not unimaginably hard, it's just really fussy and you have to have a pretty good idea what you're doing. But this is a really great thing to experiment with at home because the voltages here are very, very low. It's crazy safe. And this is the kind of stuff that you can do with a AA battery and a couple wires. So explore these, they're fun. Liquid crystal displays are really neat. And you can learn all, kind of, all kinds of really cool stuff with the polarization of light. Now, while we're talking about the display, I'm gonna try and peel the back off because there's a reflective back on this. And if I can get that off, I might, might be able to show you through it, but I gotta get this off first. Well, the good news is I got the back off pretty easily. The bad news is it left a lot of sticker residue and I'm not gonna take the time right now to clean it. But you can see here that that is transparent. You can see through it. And there are projectors that work by, pro and you can do this. You can make a little projector this way where if you feed an image to an LCD and shine a light through it, you can, you gotta be careful about heat because you can melt it pretty easy, but you can project that image on stuff. You can have fun with this. This is, this is neat toy stuff. But here, now that we can see through it, I can flex it. And you can see the colors in that. If you get a set of polarized sunglasses, you can play with this and have a lot of fun by looking through the polarized glasses and looking through the LCD. And as you turn it, just you don't have to do anything. You just turn it in relationship to your glasses and it'll get black or clear or black or clear. And that's because you're changing the polarization of the light coming through it. And when your glasses and the LCD and the LCD display are aligned, you can see through it because it's letting all the polarized light go through. When you turn them 90 degrees out, your glasses are only allowing vertically polarized light through whereas the LCD is only allowing horizontally polarized light through, so you can't see through it. It just instantly appears black. But it only appears black to you because you're wearing the glasses. So this is just kind of cool stuff. So there you have it. There's a, a quick look at a couple really basic bits of electronics, uh, a couple old scanners, and the fundamental, the look and feel differences between analog circuitry and digital circuitry. It all boils down to analog circuitry, you're dealing with continuously varying waveforms and and voltages and it's 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 always it's up and down it's all over the place it's it's more organic really with digital circuitry you're dealing more with computer stuff you're dealing with on and off boolean logic uh, it's it's a lot more involved with things like software come into play things like that digital circuitry works on states on off zero one yes, no, plus, minus, things like that. And analog circuitry is dealing with continuously variable levels. So it's, it's just a totally different world. And some people have an appreciation for one over the other. It varies wildly, but this is the 21st century and there is no reason on earth to not understand the basics of both. So you wanna go and check out here and learn about analog circuits of which there are a million. And if you're into building classic Tesla coils, analog circuits are definitely something you're gonna to wanna to know a lot about. You're gonna to need to know about RLC circuits. And if you're into building solid state Tesla coils, you're gonna to wanna to learn about digital circuits because you're gonna to have to be dealing with those as well as analog circuits. Look at all the crystals I just got, that's cool. And these are all available for you to use. All of these crystals, I think there were 11 in here. There were 10 channels and then there was an extra one knocking around in there. So there you have it. Analog versus digital, old school, new school, and crystals. You guys have fun. I'm Chris Bowden with The Geek Group. I wanna thank you for hanging out with me during this equipment autopsy. Learn more at thegeekgroup.org and you should come and get involved and be a member. Until then, we'll see you next time.
This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.